Chapter 5, Evolution and Community Ecology. In this chapter, we have four basic lessons. Lesson 1 deals with evolution. Lesson 2 is a really cool topic on species interactions. Lesson 3 talks about ecological communities. And Lesson 4 talks about the community stability. Our central case study for this chapter looks at uh, the Great Lakes and zebra mussels. Uh, you can find that in your textbook on page 124 and 125. Um, basically, zebra mussels, they are black and white uh, freshwater mussels. They are an invasive species. Um, that's why they have spread all over. And you can read more about that as the central case study. Uh, zebra mussels uh, were accidentally introduced into Lake St. Clair in the late 1980s, and they have since spread throughout the Great Lakes systems and connecting rivers. Um, the invasive mussels have a high economic and ecological cost. Um, in the talk about it section, the Great Lakes are home to more than 20 native mussel species. So what we examine in this central case study is why are the zebra and the quagga mussels so much more destructive than the lake's native mussel species. So uh, read over that as the introduction chapter opener. So in section 5.1, dealing with evolution, our guiding question in this chapter is, what role does the environment play in organisms, survival, and reproduction? And we have a bunch of, of vocabulary words introduced in this this section, uh, evolution, gene, mutation, genetic drift, natural selection, fitness, adaptation, artificial, artificial selection, speciation, and extinction. So let's take a look. Scientists have identified and described over 1.5 million species. Uh, millions more have yet to be discovered. So we think that the zebra mussel might just be one species in, in the uh, central case study, but of the 1.5 million to 1.8 million species described by scientists, many more have to be discovered yet. And we think that the total number of species in the world has a range between 13 million and 20 million, and we think that most of those species that have yet to be named are in the tropical rainforest. Um, the tropical rainforests are not the only richest place in life. We still have a lot more to explore, especially in our oceans as well. So what is evolution and natural selection? So to understand evolution and natural selection, we need to look a little bit about genetics. Um, a gene is a sequence of DNA that codes for a particular trait. Uh, we know that there are about 35,000 genes in the human genome and those genes make us unique from all other organisms. When you talk about the gene pool, the gene pool are all the genes that are present within a population. So you could talk about an organism's gene pool and you could increase that organism's gene pool when you start to have um, uh, different traits being introduced. So biological evolution is the change in a population's gene pool over time. And when you start to see a change in the gene pool, these new genes arise, come about, and you start to see some changes in the characteristics. So if you go back to genetics, you have the gene, and then you have the trait for which that gene codes for, and the gene expression would be the genotype, and then what the gene uh, genotype expresses would be the physical trait being the phenotype. So biological evolution leads to changes in the frequency of an appearance or behavior from generation to generation. So the mechanism of biological evolution is mutation and migration. So mutation is when you have accidental change in DNA that gives rise to variations among the individual. Migration is when you have gene flow, and that's the movement of individuals into, that's immigration or out of emigration, a population. 
mechanism of biological evolution, such as genetic drift and natural selection. Genetic drift uh, means that evolution that occurs by chance. Um, sometimes an unusual event, like a natural disaster or a run in, uh, with a fishing net if your fish kills or somehow separates all but a few of the individuals from a population. So the next generation would uh, therefore have a different gene pool from the original population. And therefore this would be done by chance. So that would be genetic drift. Natural selection is a process by which traits useful for survival and reproduction are passed on more frequently than those that are not. Um, uh, natural selection uh, are usually traits that improve an organism's chances for survival and reproduction. And these traits are usually the ones that are passed on more than those traits that are less desirable for the population. We learned more about evolution by natural selection in 1858. Uh, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace each independently proposed the concept of natural selection as a mechanism for evolution as a way to explain the variety of living things here on planet Earth. It was in 1859 that Darwin then pu published his book on the origin of species in which he presented decades worth of scientific evidence for natural selection um, that he has gathered over the years. Thanks largely to the foundation Darwin built, natural selection is one of the best supported theories in science today. So biological evolution, we could see that uh, a population of organisms can evolve in one of four ways through mutation, migration, genetic drift, and natural selection. So natural selection again is, here we see an example, organisms produce more offspring than can survive, individuals vary in characteristics, some of which are heritable, and individuals vary in fitness or, or in reproductive success. So Darwin privately researched natural selection for two decades before publishing all this in his book. Artificial selection is different because artificial selection is selection under human direction Throughout history, humans have chosen and bred animals and plants with beneficial traits. We started to see this in hunter-gatherer societies, where these hunter-gatherer societies, uh, when we go back to environmental times and, and looking at the societal changes, they would go out and harvest the fruits and vegetables and, and hunt, and they keep those organisms uh, that were best suitable, uh, the tastiest one, the brightest fruit, the juiciest fruit, and they'd harvest those seeds, and after time, they'd keep on planting those seeds. So that would be a type of artificial selection, or we could see this with, with animals that we breed. Um, from there, we moved into the agricultural revolution. So artificial selection is selection under human direction, and you could see that from the ancestral wolf to the St. Bernard, the Chihuahua, the Great Dane, and the Collie for animals. And here we have the ancestral brassica, which is the mustard family. And from there we have cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and broccoli. So I want to quick jump back here. When you talk about fitness, um, fitness is, means that the organisms, they are more likely to survive and produce offspring. And then over time what will happen is, because those are the organisms that are passing on their traits, that heritable trait that increases an individual's fitness would be uh, an adaptation. Speciation is a process by which new species are generated. Uh, it can occur in a number of different ways. The most important way is called allopatric speciation. Um, it has resulted in every form of life on Earth today and in the past. So in allopatric speciation, you have a single population, and then that single population might be geographically isolated uh, from, from itself. So you have two different populations of the same organism that are geographically isolated, such here as uh, in this picture by a body of water. And then what happens is you get divergence due to long-term geographical isolation. So the squirrels are no longer similar they're now starting to be different from one another 
and eventually what would happen is the isolated populations would then come together and two populations can no longer interbreed and are now two different species. Remember that the true definition of a species is an organism that is so closely related to another organism that it can breed and produce fertile offspring. So now we can't have interbreeding occurring here. Extinction uh, is the disappearance of a species from Earth. It generally occurs gradually, one species at a time. When environmental changes can, when environmental conditions change more rapidly than a species can adapt. Um, there are five known mass extinction events in geological history, each of which wiped out large portions of Earth's species. So in the diagram there, we see trilobites. Trilobites are marine arthropods that went extinct at the end of the Permian period. Um, did you know that as far as extinctions, during the Permo-Triassic extinction 250 million years ago, 70% of all land species and 90% of all marine species went extinct. So the, the five known mass extinctions throughout time occurred during the uh, Ordovician extinction, then you have the Devonian extinction, and then after that you had the Permo-Triassic extinction, then you had the N-Triassic extinction, and then about 100 million years ago, there was the crustaceous tertiary extinction. So the way at which a type of organism, a type of extinction occurs is referred to as the background extinction rate. And uh, the Earth has seen these five events of staggering portions that killed, that killed huge numbers of species at once. And these mass extinctions have occurred widely spaced intervals and have wiped out large portions of the planet species. The best known mass extinction occurred 65 million years ago and brought an end to the dinosaurs along with many other life forms. So that's it for chapter 5, section 1.